Welcome to a series on forgiveness. You as a church have chosen as your watchword for this year, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. This series will focus on the last phrase of that verse, forgive as you have been forgiven. But who are Keith and Catherine? Let us share a little bit about ourselves. Keith grew up on a farm in Tatramoa in New Zealand. For eight years, I was a principal CEO of Emmaus Bible College in Sydney. Catherine grew up in Melbourne, Australia. She became a Christian at the 1959 Billy Graham Crusade. Catherine is a trained kindergarten teacher. We met each other on a short-term mission in Suva, Fiji. After marrying, we became missionaries in Rome, Italy. It's been our privilege to share the Word of God in a number of countries, Australia, Fiji, Ghana, Italy, Malta, New Zealand, the UK, Bermuda, USA and Zambia. We're commissioned to a Bible teaching ministry to serve local churches and individuals, both here in Australia and overseas. Catherine uses our home for hospitality and is a speaker to different groups. At our home church, Catherine is a member of our pastoral care team and also looks after the library. She is the secretary of the CWCI International Board and a member of Dandenong Rangers CWCI Committee. The subject of Keith's dissertation of um, doctoral thesis is forgiveness. I've presented a number of papers for the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society, including Understanding and Practicing Forgiveness, a Biblical and Theological Approach. Catherine enjoys photography, ceramics, gardening, reading, crafts, cooking and travelling. Keith enjoys fishing, hunting, ceramics, reading, travelling, cooking. I just cooked a Christmas cake and gardening. And here he is shearing a sheep. As we look at different aspects of forgiveness, if you have any questions as we go through this week by week, send them through to Tim or one of the other leaders of the church. And they can forward them on to me. And then each week at the beginning of the sessions, I'll answer some of those questions. We're looking forward to sharing with you on this vital topic. C.S. Lewis said, Forgiveness is a beautiful word until you have something to forgive. Chesterton wrote, Forgiveness means pardoning the unpardonable, or it isn't forgiveness at all. Blackwell wrote, The hatred you're carrying is a live coal in your heart, far more damaging to yourself than to others if you don't forgive. Another person said, As long as you don't forgive, who and whatever it is that occupy the rent-free space in your mind is going to destroy you. Forgiveness is the costliest luxury in the world. Freud said, one must forgive one's enemies, but not before they're hanged. In 1990, when I began my research, I searched three data files. It had only yielded 140 titles. But in 2016, when I put in Google Scholar, the word forgiveness, there were 255,000 hits in 0.3 of a second. There's been a massive increase in the discussion on forgiveness. Recently in the USA, $14 million was raised to underwrite a project, a campaign for forgiveness research. $14 million. That shows the importance of our topic. A summary of those findings has been published in a recent journal. Forgiveness is often promoted as a means of peacemaking, restoring harmony, 
meaning relationships, overcoming bitterness, foregoing revenge, improving one's health, or raising national debt. Schultz and Sandage noted, one of the problems in the current literature is the lack of clarity in defining the meaning of forgiveness and the use of the term itself. Often studies begin assuming everybody who's reading the study or hearing about it knows what forgiveness means. But is that true? According to these scholars, no. There's confusion. What does forgiveness mean? Because if we don't know what it means, how can we practice it? I believe the lack of clarity in the meaning of forgiveness can be overcome if we look at what the Bible has to say. The teaching and practice of forgiveness is best understood from a Judeo-Christian perspective. In other words, from the Bible. In the Bible, forgiveness is a multi-dimensional concept. Different writers use 24 dramatic idioms to express the meaning of forgiveness. They are word pictures or metaphors that present forgiveness from, from varying perspectives. The Old Testament uses 12 different words, and these can mean stampled, stamped underfoot, covered, washed away, buried, blotted out, charges dropped, forgotten, removed as far as the east is from the west, pardoned, sin can be wiped away, the forgiven is purified and stands pure in God's sight. But in the New Testament, we have another range of words, 12 words. And these can mean healed relationships, pardon, cleansing, erasure of a record, cost-bearing, the removal of a burden, mercy, acceptance, termination of negative feelings, and the cancellation of debt. So there's a broad range underlying the biblical understanding, the Bible understanding of what forgiveness means and the outcomes of forgiveness. So God's word must be central if we're to truly grasp and understand and practice forgiveness as God intends us. Forgiveness is the heart of our witness as Christians. It's vital to our witness. Jesus is the paradigm of forgiveness. He models it. He shows us what to do. At the end of his ministry, he says, the disciples are to go into all the world and preach repentance and forgiveness in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. That's the core of the Bible message. And so in the book of Acts and in the letters to different churches, we see the apostles and Paul practicing forgiveness. They proclaim it. They teach it. They talk about it. They explain it. But then also the church is to model forgiveness. And that's part of your key verse for this year. So in this series, we're going to cover a wide range of things. Forgiveness has been the costliest luxury in the world, and that's what we'll focus on today. But it also is an act of pardon, an act of mercy, an act of cleansing, dealing with the burden of sin and shame and guilt, the erasure of the mental and written records of wrongdoing, but also the termination of negative emotions, the way that we feel to those who have wronged us, the signs of true repentance, unconditional acceptance of the person who's violated our boundaries, a healed relationship, but then the process of actually being a forgiver. And what happens when people will not accept forgiveness? But then there's different types of forgivers. The Christian life is born in forgiveness. Forgiveness is to characterize our interpersonal relationships. It should mark us out as be belonging to God's family, of being a Christian, because we are to model and reflect the way that God has dealt with us by forgiving those who sin against us. But that's not easy. Forgiveness is costly, it's not cheap. To be forgiven is a luxury. So let's think about what that means for you and me. 
Each of us believe that when somebody has broken our boundaries, violated us, wronged us, sinned against us, hurt us in some way, we think that somehow or other they should be punished. But Peter in the first century asked the question of Jesus, if someone sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Seventy times seven? And so Jesus tells us a story. But that's a universal Christian. How often should I forgive those who sin against me? So Peter said, up to seven times? Then look out if they keep on doing that. I like comic strips. And so it deals with the problem of forgiveness. So Lucy says, I'll get you, Charlie Brown. I'll get you. I'll knock off your block, Charlie Brown. Hey, wait a minute, says Charlie. Hold everything. We can't carry on like this. We have no right to act this way. The whole world is filled with problems. People hurting other people. People not understanding other people. Like we see at present on our TV screen every night. And so Charlie says, now if we as children can't solve what are relatively minor problems, how can we ever expect to? Pows! And Lucy hits him. And so she says, I had to hit him quick. He was beginning to make sense. So let's read from the Bible. This is from Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus tells the story about how much it costs to forgive a sinner. How much it costs for, to forgive those who sin against us. So let's read. Peter came up and asked Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive someone who sins against me? You know, does something wrong to me. Is seven times enough? And Jesus answered, not just seven times, but 77 times. You see, the kingdom of heaven is like this. One day a king decided to call in the officials and ask them to give an account of what they owed to him. And as he was doing this, one official was brought in who owed him 10,000 talents, about 50 million silver coins. But he didn't have any money to pay back what he owed. So the king ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children, and all that he owed in order to pay that debt. The official got down on his knees and began begging, Have pity on me! I'll repay you every cent I owe, he says. And so the king took pity on that official, cancelled his debt, and let him go. But when that official went out, he found one of his fellow officers, who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him and he says, Pay back what you owe me. This, his fellow officials, this fellow official fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me. I'll repay you. But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay that debt. When the other officials saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told the king everything that had happened. Then the king called in that official. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all your debt because you begged me to. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow official as I had mercy on you? In anger, the king turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. That's exactly how my heavenly Father will treat each of you, unless you forgive your brother, or your sister, or your mum, your dad, your workmate, your colleague, your spouse, your children. Forgive them from your heart. So we all believe that somebody should pay. That's true in this story. Boundaries have been violated. There was a debt to pay. 
And that's how you feel, the people who have wronged you, hurt you, sinned against you. You feel that somehow or other they should be made to pay. That's how we all feel. But can repayment really restore what was taken? Making things right is usually beyond possibility. You know, I could tell you a scandal about one of your leaders here at President Avenue. I could start a gossip chain. And they may be take me to court for libel. Mr. Kelly may do that. And he may well win the case. And I get fined for having maligned him in some way. But that, does that take away the way that I've wounded his reputation? No, it doesn't. That lingers on in the minds of people. And from then on, they'll view Mr. Kelly in a different way because of what I'd said. So repayment is not always possible. In fact, it's impossible when somebody has wronged us in some way. Well, you might say, well, if I can't get repayment, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to get even. You know, tit for tat. You see kids playing this game. You know, one hits one, then the other one responds in some way, or kicks one, whatever, and away it goes. We kind of feel that somehow or other, we'll carry out revenge. But the problem is, who keeps the score? How do I know when I've got even for those who have sinned against me? Who's the umpire? And often when people are alienated, they use different formulas to keep the score of the wrongs. I can remember talking to a couple, and they were older than Catherine and I, and they started to chat and talk, and suddenly it came to the service that way, way back on their honeymoon, one had offended the other. And one of them brought it up. You see, they'd kept the score for years and years and years. Somehow or other, they wanted revenge. And because of that, they behaved in different ways, in ways that they shouldn't have done as a spouse. So how much do I owe Catherine for a burnt meal, a burnt cake or a burnt piece of toast, or spilled coffee when she's passing it to me? What sort of revenge can I take out? Throw a boiling cup of water back at her? But revenge really is impotent. And as long as I seek to carry out revenge against those who have wronged me, and people have wronged us, it glues me to the past, to that incident, to that event or events. And it doesn't matter how I try to get even, it's really impotent in the way that I act. Someone said that holding resentment, harboring resentment, having a chip on our shoulder is like eating poison and waiting for the other person to keel over. It doesn't work. But so often we're trapped into that. And some of you today may feel bitter. You've been deeply wounded and it hurts. The Bible doesn't downplay that. It doesn't wink at what's been wrong. But holding that resentment, that grudge, nursing it so it colours our horizon, it affects our dreams, it's like we become people who hate and it's a slow form of suicide. The Bible warned us that don't let the root of bitterness grow up in you because it will destroy you and others. It affects other people. It has a flow-on effect. Someone says resentment, you know, is the opposite to forgiveness. Forgiveness means I have to let go of the past to those events, to those hurts, to those wrongs. And you're just the same. Resentment is really impractical. But there's so, so many people in our society, in our churches, who harbour resentment. 
And so in this chapter that Jesus is talking, he talks about the problem that we face, the problem of a sinning person, the person who wrongs us. And so he talks initially about pursuing that friend, going and talking to them, confronting them, seeing if they won't have a change of heart. And if they won't listen, to take somebody else with us who's also a witness to what they've done wrong. But if they won't listen at all, then they're to tell the whole church. And then we come to the story that we've read. The problem of the person who keeps on repeating what they've done wrong. And some of you have lived in contexts like that, or maybe are still living in a context like that. A person continues to wrong you again and again and again. We have a neighbour who was like that, and in the end his wife said to him, Listen, if you don't stop drinking, you have to go. Because night after night, day after day, he would drink and drink way too much. And when our recycle bins were being emptied, He's made no, more noise than anybody else in the whole street. He was a heavy drinker. He was an alcoholic. And so Jesus tells this story about the two debtors and the principle of forgiveness that we are to forgive from our hearts, to have a change in the way that we feel towards those who have hurt us and hurt us deeply. So in this story that Jesus tells, he talks about the fact of how much is being owed. 10,000 talents. Now that doesn't mean anything to, it, to us in our currency. But the yearly income for the King Herod of that day in the first century was 900 talents. So if you think of the Queen's income today, I have no idea how many British pounds it's worth, pounds sterling, but it's huge. Or the taxes gathered for the two regions in Israel only amounted to 200 talents. A daily wage was about a denarius. So this debt of 10,000 talents that this person owes to the king, it's a debt equivalent to 30 million days of labour. 30 million days. Or a lifetime of 1,775 days. times 70 years. That's massive. It's an impossible debt. There's no way that he can get out under it. There's no way that he can get a lender to lend him this. He is stuck with this huge burden, this huge debt. that's going to damn him. And so when the king calls him to account, what does he do? He's aware of the facts. He's aware of his dilemma. He can't get out of it. He can't kind of brush it off. So notice what he does, the position that he adopts. He bows down in front of the king like an act of reverence, an act of honour. He almost kneels down and worships him and asks the king to be patient with him. And he says, in the end, I'll pray you back everything. Well, that's a, that was a fake promise. He couldn't do that. But as the king saw his dilemma and saw his attitude, the king has mercy on him, has pity on him. He feels for him. He had great affection and compassion. So he cancels the debt and sets him free, releases him, lets him go. Well, you'd think he'd go down the road skipping and singing, Oh, happy day, that freed my debt. But no, he goes outside and begins to hunt for one of his fellow servants. All over the place, it says, the word for found him, he searched everywhere. He was looking for this guy who owed him a hundred talents, about 18 weeks wages. And he grabs him by the neck and says, pay me back what you owe or I'll put you in prison. And so his fellow um, worker falls down in front of him, reverences him and begs him to forgive him. But uh, uh, the fellow employee was not going to do that, no way knowing. And so he gets him chucked into prison. Well, the other 
employees are amazed at this. And they go and tell the king. And the king is pretty upset. But notice the words that the king uses. The king described him as a wicked servant. He calls him in and says, now listen here. You wicked servant. This man's evil on the inside. He's had no change of heart. The word evil is used in this gospel or someone who's morally corrupt. Their actions are evil. Jesus said that we're to pray that we might be rescued from the evil one. When he talks about people who have bad fruit, worthless fruit, there's a serious fault. And that was true of this man. Internally, he was a wicked, evil person. He had no sense of any feeling towards his fellow workmate. And so the king says to him, Should you not have had mercy on your fellow official as I had mercy on you? In anger, the king turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you, unless you forgive your brother, or whoever, from your heart. Now these are serious words. Notice what Jesus is saying. That the way that we relate to other human beings is the way that God is going to relate to us. And so Jesus gives us a, a real principle here. We are to forgive from the heart. In other words, there's a change in the way that I feel towards the person who's wronged me. There's a good illustration of this in the play called Les Miserables, which depicts a Frenchman who stole a loaf of bread because his family was starving. And he's caught. And he's sentenced to years and years hard labour on the galleys and so on. And in the end, he's in a quarry. He tries to escape and his sentence is lengthened. And after 20 years, in the end, he is set free. And one of those who were the prison officers, he was a mean man. And he gives him his papers, which would say that he was, had been a thief. And in France at that time, unless you could present your papers, it was hard to get a job. So Jean Valjean goes and leaves the, the prison and tries to get a job. And no one will employ him. He tries to find someone to sleep for the night and no one will let him in. And in the end, someone said, oh, look, knock on that door over there. So he knocked on the door and who should answer it? but a clergyman. And he sees Jean Valjean. He says, come in, come in, he says. And so Jean Valjean says, look, I'm just looking for a bed for the night. And the clergyman says, that's okay, you're welcome. We've got plenty of food. We're happy to share it with you. Come on, sit down. Have a wash, get cleaned up. And you can sleep the night, that's fine. And so Jean Valjean enjoyed a very good home-cooked meal. And then goes to sleep. But he doesn't sleep very long. He gets up in the night, grabs a pillow slip, and stuffs as much silver as he could find into the pillow slip. The silver cutlery and this, that, and the other thing. And off he goes out the door and goes down the street. Well, about midway through the next morning, there's a knock on the clergyman's door. And lo and behold, here's John Darms there, too. French policeman with Jean Valjean and they say to the clergyman listen we think this man stole your silver in the night and the clergyman looked at Jean Valjean he says oh he says Jean Valjean he says you forgot to take the silver candlesticks he said to the police it's okay let him go and so the clergyman goes off and gets these two silver candlesticks and gives them to him and then notice what he says he says, take these and use them to be an honest man. 
You see, he showed compassion. He showed mercy. He forgave Jean Valjean from the heart. There were no ill feelings. There was no resentment, no hostility, no hatred. He set the man free. And from then on, Jean Valjean lived a transformed life. That's how God can treat you and I. God can forgive our sin, cancel our debt. Why? Because the cost of what we've done wrong, our sin, has been the penalty for that, the cost of that, the penalty of death has been borne by the Lord Jesus. He's paid our debt. The Bible reminds us why we were sinners, Christ died for us. Why were the people we are? That Christ died for the ungodly, like us. But then the Bible also says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Our wrongdoing, our sin is against God. And it creates a massive debt. A debt that we cannot clear. It's impossible for us. But Jesus, by his death, paid the penalty for all my sin, for all your sin. God doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't brush it under the carpet as though it doesn't matter. He looks it square in the eye and he calls sin, sin. But that doesn't matter. Because of our predicament, our plight, our sin, our debt, he sent Jesus to be our saviour. Someone said Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we had a debt we couldn't pay. And that's true. So we shouldn't be deluded into thinking that forgiveness is easy. It's not. Forgiveness is costly. But our key verse as a church is, forgive as Christ forgave you. And you and I know that's hard, isn't it? It's not easy. Some of us are bitty, bitter. Some of us are trying to carry out revenge. Some of us are trying to make the other person pay. Some of us are nursing a grudge. But if I'm going to do what Jesus did, how am I going to be able to do that? How can I implement what Jesus is saying? I am to forgive those who have wronged me. You are to forgive those who have wronged you. From the heart. Internally. So the way that I feel, the way that I think towards that person changes. So that means my willingness to be humble. I'm no better than the people who have wronged me. I'm not superior. I'm not greater. Like them, I too am a sinner. And I too need forgiveness. So I have to give up a false view of myself and see myself greater and purer and holier than the person who's wronged me. But also I have to give up my right to relinquish it, to let it go, to make them somehow or other pay. I have to accept the cost of what's been done wrong against me and forgive the person, to discharge them, to let them go. And so the challenge for us, the challenge for you, the challenge for me, am I holding out on those who have sinned against me, not prepared to accept the cost the ramifications of what's been done. Or am I going to do what Jesus asks, tells us, commands us, to forgive as God and Christ has forgiven us. And as we're aware of what huge debt that God has discharged us from, he's taken away all my sin, all my wrongdoing, And the way he feels towards me is one of acceptance. 
the way he feels towards you, if we've confessed our sins, he forgives us, he cleanses us, he makes us one of his children. And my prayer is, as we go through this series together, that God will help each of us to not only know about forgiveness, but to learn how to practice forgiveness, to forgive as God in Christ forgave us. I look forward to seeing you next week. Amen.